you may be interested to know that uh, uh, there would be a focus session on knotted biomolecules at the American Physical Society March meeting in New Orleans in mid-March. So the story for me started some 16 years ago with Huang, Chin Suan Huang, a graduate student of mine and Mark Robbins of Johns Hopkins University. But the knotted part really started with Janna Sukowska around some 10 years ago and uh, who did a survey of thousands of proteins and, uh, and then that was expanded to 20,000 but Mateo Shikora in the context of stretching and to invest, find proteins which are particularly stable mechanically and it turned out that one of these proteins was knotted and that's how Janna Sukowska got into the business, that's my belief and then there were many other people and I'll focus on uh, uh, things that were done then in collaboration with Madrid, Carion, Mariano Carion Vasquez, and our joint graduate students, Angel Gomez Sicilia, Mateusz Fastek, who is to graduate in a month, uh, Adolfo Poma, Wołek, and Jani Zhao. Now, uh, so, so you know that PDB contains pr proteins with knots. And um, the, so the, one of the issues is what is the role of the knots? You know, we know that they may provide stability, at least in the region when you have a knot. But today I would I, like to focus at the end of the talk on some negative role of the knots that is they may, we propose, I may be wrong, that they may be a component in, neuro, in creating neurodegeneracy. And so I'll be focusing really on the role of ribosomes and proteosomes, but before I get to that, I want to make a rapid overview of large conformational changes that you, you can have when you have proteins with knots. It's changes that arise when you stretch, fold, thermally unfold, or put a protein at the air-water interface, you know, that affects the conformation of the protein. So these kind of things take, you know, take place in a long time scale, so it's practically impossible to study this with an all-atom model. So we, have a, we use a coarse grain model, uh, which I'll describe in a minute, and then we detect the presence of the knot uh, following the conyaris mothokumar taylor algorithm in which you consider a triangle of points and see whether there's some a backbone which goes through this triangle or not. If it doesn't, then you eliminate it by a, a, this individual thing, a bond, and then you can also identify the ends of the knot uh, when you prune it at both ends and seeing that at some point the knot disappears. So you distinguish between deep knots and shallow knots in practice. That means that at least one of the, this is our MSF fluctuations, that at least is like eight or less uh, residues are, you know, that the knot extends between a point which is close to the terminus, like eight residues or less, then this is shallow, otherwise it's deep, and then you get small fluctuations there that gives rise to enhanced stability. Now, um, so let me start with uh, uh, the thing that was first for me, that is stretching of proteins by means of AFM, atomic force microscope. So basically we take a molecule uh, or, combina or combination of these molecules and you stretch it and then you see a series of peaks and you, they, then you want to, you see that some characteristic force and you want to understand it and you want to see you, why it has this value like for titan, titan is of order 200 piconetons and it's due to shearing. You pull with this end to the right and this end to the left and you get a big force of 200 piconetons. So if you take two strands of DNA and uh, start pulling apart, then the typical force is for the 15 piconewtons, or 20 perhaps. So this means it's a cooperative action of many bonds together. So, uh, when, uh, so in order to study such things, we have a model in which you represent each residue by a ball, and uh, which is a certain distance apart, like 3.8 angstrom. So of course this is not a protein yet. So in order to uh, make it to behave like a protein, you introduce certain attractive interactions, which are called contacts. And there are various ways of uh, introducing these contacts. You know, it turns out that the potential, specific potential, do not match much, that much, so we'll use Leonard Jones, but if you use more, so whatever, it's, it's not that crucial. 
as was shown by Joanna, but uh, what is important is the contact map, what is connected to what. Now, um, so how do you do it? So basically we do it like this, that we read, all, or, uh, we read the all atom structure of the protein and represent its heavy atoms by um, uh, spheres and large the beta account for attraction. So in this way, each uh, amino acid is represented by a cluster of grapes and then this is the grapes overlap in the native states and you say it's a native contact there. Otherwise, there is no native contact, and there you introduce uh, an attraction, uh, repulsion so that, that the chain doesn't behave like a ghost. Now, uh, so let's say that I put this kind of contact, Leonard Jones, but which uh, minimum, which agrees with the experimental uh, determined distance between the C alpha atoms. And uh, then you need, there's a problem, what is the order of magnitude of epsilon? What is, so we did the calibration by uh, comparing theoretical results to experimental data on some 39 proteins at experimental speed. So we do it at certain speed, typically. It's, sometimes it is experimental, sometimes it's not, but at, you know, perhaps it's 10 or 100 times faster, but then you can extrapolate to experimental speed, and that's how we get this calibration, which agrees with the strength of the hydrogen bond, stronger hydrogen bond. So that means that the unit of force I'll be using is like 100 piconewtons, and the room temperature is like 0 0.3, 0 0.35 of that epsilon. And then we have implicit water, which means that we have Langevin noise and dump velocity-dependent dumping, and what we do is to solve molecular dynamics equations, you know, by the fifth order predictor corrector method. Now, so I already mentioned the survey, and this is the website devoted to it. But in another outcome of that, that we found a class of proteins which contain a motif known as cysteine nut, which has, say, four amino acids here, four amino acids there, a disulfide bond here, another there, so this is a ring. But then there's a third disulfide bond which may pierce the ring, and then when you start stretching, we'd like to form a slip knob. Uh, you know, which you would like to go through this ring, and this gives rise, we predict, but no one, unfortunately, we would try to measure that. Uh, could, the forces can go even to 1,500 piconewtons. So now let's start the proteins with nodes, and again, as I, let's start with stretching. Uh, so, uh, so I just mentioned three items about stretching here. One, is that this is, uh, this is important because this is, in practice, the only experimental well, a way to tell the knot in a, in a protein or biomolecule in general than if you do single molecule study because the length is shorter because the, when you stretch, then the knot gets tightened and it, that takes some space, so it's not the full length of the protein. And it's, sh it's shortened, so that's how you can detect it. Second is that it turns out that this knot ends can jump along the sequence in a discrete fashion. They do not diffuse like for, for homopolymer, but they do it in a discrete way. Third, there are two types of, types of trajectory, one in which the knot keeps being tightened within the remaining part of the protein, like here, and, uh, but sometimes you can also get it separated, that knot gets tightened, but the protein is not yet fully dissolved or fully unraveled and which mechanism prevails depending on the protein. Now, let's now start the thermal folding. So there's a well-known paper from San Diego, including Kiana Sukowska. So we, they say that it's not persist after the structures unfold thermally. So the theoretical calculation was done by thermal you know, protocol, whereas an experiment of uh, Jennings and her people were actually by application of the nature. So is that really, well, we tested it as a byproduct of something else. It was not our goal in life. But it turns out that the thing is a bit more complicated, that you indeed get this, that you can uh, you know, break all contacts and yet have a knot on a very high temperature, like 1.5 in our units. But that temperature is um, uh, unrealistically high, like 1300 Kelvin. Okay. But if you consider lower temperatures of thermal unfolding, that it's not so, that it's, you know, it's typically not unties before unfolding takes place. Now, um, now let's consider folding. So the, it's easiest, it's good to start with the, the smallest protein that has a knot, which is this fellow. Um, uh, so the, uh, 
So that was studied in two groups, bioatom simulation here by starting from a slip knotted state and here by having some biasing uh, method which, involved, which is known as dominant reaction pathway and they had 32 successful trajectories. In both studies uh, they had one temperature. Uh, whereas if you have coarse grained models, then you have the privilege of studying temperature, whatever temperature you want. I mean, you can have hundreds of trajectories of thousands and many temperatures. Now, so, so they identify th three mechanisms for this particular pro folding mechanism for this shallowly knotted protein. The one is direct threading. So this goes through this. And another one is slip knotting, that instead of doing something like this, it just makes a you know, some U-shaped thing. And then this mouth trapping, and this is really very much like uh, direct threading, except that it's, this, it's not the, the terminal, the terminals that go through the loop, it's rather the loop that goes onto the, the reversals, but otherwise it's quite similar. So they, had, they found that this is dominating and, this is, uh, and these two are less dominating. So now when we studied it, that we indeed found that but in addition, we have found that the other trajectories, in, in, these are sort of single loops that you can say direct threading like, or mouse trapping this way. Uh, but we've also found that uh, most of the events, and that also depends on the temperature, all the weights are controlled by the temperature, go through a two-loop mechanism. That you, instead of forming one big loop, you form two loops at various stages, and then you at this mechanism operate at, uh, at this smaller loop and, and they come to the same thing, okay? Uh, and there could be many possibilities that you do direct threading, then mouse trapping, direct threading, direct threading, or embrace, or oh, there's another fun thing that we found, embrace, that you have a loop like this and the wire underneath and you embrace it, you know? So that's a new mechanism, okay, if you wish. So, uh, uh, so, but there's in there, the, the question is how does the, what is the characteristic folding time and what is the probability to obtain a knot? So this thing in red is the success rate, that is how many, per, what percentage of the trajectory gave rise to proper knotting. And that, this probability depends very much on the temperature at which you did the study, okay? Now, this is the temperature, the folding time, you know, so there's an optimum basin of the optimum folding, that is what is the time required to do it, okay? And, but you see this basin overlaps with the success in knotting, okay? The room temperature, I think it's somewhere here, okay? It's qualitative, but they, the two overlap, and, but the biggest probability to form a shallow knot, this particular shallow knot is 72%. Uh, we also have misfolding in which contacts are established without forming a knot. Now let's go to deeply knotted proteins. And there's a paper which says that it's difficult to form a, uh, form a deeply knotted uh, structure. Um, and this particular protein was considered. They get like 1%, 2% success rate. And in order to dodge the crisis of folding of protein, you need to have a fold a, form a slip knot, and that slip knot would go through the knot loop, and that would give rise to folding. And, uh, okay. And now we do it, and we have thousands of trajectories, tens of temperatures, and get zero success rate. So we got to this knotted willow state of despair. <laughs> So this is a knotted willow, okay? <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but it turned out uh, that, but what we did was, like that what we learned later, that if instead of starting from extended states, which have no contact, but you use the thermal uh, unraveled states, which have no contact, and yet they are sort of, could be not like, okay? Then, then we could get some one, two percent. Okay, so, so the result you get depends on the preparation of the initial state. That's what we believe on in now. But now, because of this knotted state, <laughs> all right, I, go model, yes. I, 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 I forgot to mention that. Yeah, the contacts were obtained in this uh, native state, so it's structured, based, and uh, yes. But I mean, the other studies, uh, which were not all atom, were also, go, you know, go model. Um, so now, but because of this uh, knotted willow state, 
uh, we were thinking what, what can improve this folding. And that's what gave, gave, you know, led us to consideration of uh, ribosome. Or what is the role of the ribosome in maybe the knot is form, formed through the ribosomal action that David Lay was showing quite nice, nice pictures of how it works. But basically, you have mRNA, and then you have protein emerging the end terminus first. And what we find, the translation, this translation process uh, facilitate, facilitates not formation. And uh, our first study was very simple. That was we used just a, a situation. We imagined that you have a plane, and then like you know, Midwest plain, <laughs> and then you grow a plant, okay, and this plant, this flower grows, you know, first there's one residue, then two residues, and so on, okay. Then we complicated it, but let's discuss this first. Uh, so what happens is that initially it grew that much, then it went to that stage, and it kept growing, and finally when it got detached, it, it formed a knot, okay. But now let's look, so the Purple ball is the beginning of the slip, the slip knot that is about to be formed. And, um, yeah. So, uh, so, but let's look at it more closely. So there's, there's a certain stage when I'm residue 132 is about to be born. And there's certain waiting time. You know, you don't do it, you know, you, know, you do it in steps, okay? And then you do molecular dynamics. So it turns out that you form as a, as a knot loop, Okay, and arginine went into one, goes to the center in the loop, and then this is the end piece which eventually formed the slip knot, a slip knot, a slip knot. Okay, so when it finally detached, then it would go through make, a, make the knotting process. Okay, but this this plane is essential, and the and the surface from which this flower is growing. For, for one thing, it reduces the entropy you know, of possible conformations, but more importantly, uh, it positions, it facilitates formation of this, this knot loop, okay? So that this, this ending part is, might, finds it easier to go through it, you know? So it positions it properly. So this is a vital role, actually. Right, right. Uh, so when you do the, and this, okay. So when you do that, you know, then again, what you find is that the folding time or success rate or whatever you want to study is temperature dependent. You know, it's not just that folding is something; it depends on the temperature. If it's too high, you never fold for entropic reasons. If it's too low, it never folds because of uh, spin glass reasons. But there is a regime in which it does fold, and so we get. Um, Okay, and if you start from a slip knot, you get 75% success rate. But if you do not start with a slip knot, you get like, say, nearly 3%. Okay, but there is another thing that uh, this uh, overlap based contact map, well, is an approximation and it uh, works pretty well. But there's the other approaches, like a thing called CSU, which stands for contact of structural units, which, consider, which finds much fewer contacts, like, you know, I think a quarter of what the overlap would find, but this is based on chemical considerations, and it also includes certain ionic bridges that were missed and so on. So, so there's a considerable overlap between the CSU-based contacts and our thing, but there are some contacts missing. So if you add just one contact here, okay, then it jumps to 5%, okay? And if you add 20 additional contacts that arise from the CSU, it boosted it in further to 6%. So, and then there's a well-known paper by Shachnovich and Kolab Valin, Zeldovich, and Shachnovich that say that, it's a, that it is the non-native contacts that are important for folding of knotted structure. But we say that, okay, but this thing is not at all in this regime. They select it on a certain, uh, you know, non-native contacts, not all of them, but some fraction, okay, very cleverly in certain range, which roughly agrees with this. But in our definition of a contact, this is a native contact, okay? They had some criterion based on the distance between heavy atoms being smaller than 4.5 angstroms, and for them it was not native, but in our approach it is actually native. So I, I would dismiss this claim. So now, uh, all right, but now if you redo this thing, you grow your flower for the shallow linotet knot, then you, 
enhance the folding rate to, from 72% to 83% is the optimality. However, this, is not a, this uh, ribosome thing is not essential for the very process of folding. Okay? It just boosts it, whereas for a deeply knotted uh, protein, it leads to us like it's crucial. Okay? And, okay, now we do studies, which, but it's not completed, so I won't show you any result, but then we do more molecular representation of this uh, ribosome, and this is this flower growing surrounded by the walls of the channel of the ribosome, and again, it, 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 it makes, it, makes folding easier because various structures get formed. However, the knotted structure emerges at the end of the process once it goes out of the ribosome, as uh, Sophie was saying. So now let's consider the next stage of the circle of life. Now you will get creation, I mean, generation of proteins, and now let's degrade them. So that takes place in proteosomes. This comes with various names, but I use this generic term. Degradation could be selective or non-selective, but most of it is actually selective. And it's in bacteria, it goes, uh, it's performed by this clip or lawn and other structures. In, in uh, eukaryotes, it's a structure called 26S, but each of them looks like a barrel which has a core particle in which, lie, in which the, the very act of degradation takes place. And there is the entry chamber, which is called regulatory particle, which recognizes the protein to be degraded and then unfolds it and then feeds it to the, to the trash bin. Okay. So, uh, so there was also uh, a well-known experiment by Bustamante and his people in Berkeley in which they measured the stalling force. Okay, so basically here you have a proteosome in the bacterial one, clip P and clip X, this uh, regulatory and the other particle. And then you have titan for control and they studied green fluorescent protein. And then on the other side they were pulling it back. And they were asking at what force would you stop the degradation process, that is, it won't go in, okay? And they found it would be like 20 piconewtons, and another thing that is interesting for me is that they, the duration of the process is such that it takes like 80 residues per second to do that, okay? And um, so now, we want, that's a complicated system. Um, we already have part of our uh, methods that's a grow, uh, coarse grain model, but we need to model, it, model the proteasome. So we model it as a combination of a torus and a cylinder. So overall it forms like a funnel-like structure. And the parameters of the torus and the cylinder are obtained by considering this crystal structure of the, of, of these particles. So typically it's like this. And you can and the degradation and it could be so. Okay, that's part of it. That's one part of it is that you have this uh, funnel which provides a repulsive force or no attraction. That's one thing. And another, then you cannot really model the degradation itself. So what we do is we apply a pulling force inside here, of, and we and we, con, we are mostly interested in the context of co co constant pulling force. Okay. And maybe in the real life it could be also periodic because it's ATP controlled, so we studied that as well. But, but basic mode is constant force. Now, so there are actually three modes, three particles of pulling. This is like AFM-like pulling when you, all you do is to anchor one end and then pull the other. That could be done at constant speed or constant force. This is how the, uh, the protein should function. So the protein comes with or without the knot and then it gets pulled, it unfolds. Uh, but then in Bustamante's experiment, you, you pull with that force and then, but, and you anchor it on the other end and you pull with the force to the right. But uh, there's a third force that they didn't consider that is the reaction of the, of the proteosome by third Newton's law. So you, if this protein pushes on the proteosome, then the proteosome reacts back. So, in my opinion, uh, what is measured here at this end is the difference between this and that and not just this, which will be important in a minute. Because, uh, well, while we observe that when you put that this uh, force at the other end varies in time because the protein comes through various uh, structures, it unfolds, so it goes through various stages, and therefore it leans on the funnel in different ways. 
But whatever you do, the force at the other end is much smaller than the pulling force. So that's what we explain it. So that's why we believe that what is measured is the difference between the two. Uh, now, um, so now we should do it at constant, uh, well, okay. What happens is that we observe that if you study proteins without knots, then this very f shape of the funnel facilitates unfolding and therefore facilitates degradation. Because, for instance, what was shearing because of the presence of the proteasome becomes uh, unzipping. And so one example is like this. So if you ask what is the time to f translocate fully, I mean to fully you know, stretch, okay, as a function of the applied constant force. So the, in the absence of the proteasome is a line like this, so the force of three in our theoretical units, the time is very, very long, okay? But if you do apply this proteasome, then, you, you know, then this kind of time scale is obtained at much lower forces, independent of the protocol of pulling and independent of whether you pull by, I, by N or by C, you know, it's much, much better. Uh, but when you extrapolate it to this time scale of 80 residues per second, okay, then we get a force of order 120 piconewtons and not 20. So we believe that's a, that what is measured is a difference. Now, uh, so now let's go to neurotoxicity. And uh, so that was just published and made it to the cover. So, uh, uh, so, so basically why would, now I would study proteins with knots, okay? Per, not, proteins with uh, permanent knots, that is native knots, but also intrinsically disordered proteins which are actually poly-Q chains, okay? So I need to explain that. So if you have a knot and it goes into the funnel, then, uh, uh, well, if you, make, if you are lucky, it will go through, okay? But the probability of jamming the proteasome and not making it, making it through is big, okay? So, so in this case, when you do have a knot, then instead of facilitating degradation, you know, the proteasome actually makes it harder because it may stop the entry, okay? And so one example of this is here, you know, in this case, uh, okay, so this is a situation you pull by N, terminus in proto protocol of one, and one trajectory is one that, you know, it's, you know, uh, you know this is it just goes through, the, the large force does not generate. Uh, but, but here just go through and that's it, okay? It translocates. And the knot ends disappear, you know, they go to plus and minus infinity. But in this trajectory, there is jamming and the knots get stuck at certain, in stages that I mentioned before in certain characteristic places and then it's stuck there. Uh, all right, so you can, okay, and maybe I should mention that, so in this review by Virna, Mirna, and Kardar, uh, it was mentioned that this uh, UCHL3 may resist proteosomal unfolding, but it was a hypothesis. So here, using our model, we, we show it, you know, that, it, it, that it's, this is what's happening. So we also studied forces. So it's what you get, it depends on the protein, and it depends on the, on the end by which you pull. But overall, if you have a knot, it's harder. If you do statistic, it's harder. To, you, the probability of getting jammed is large. And we, so this is periodic force, and, it's, and if you do it periodic, then uh, it's actually unfolding. It can, the protein can be pulled and relax, and when the, it's not pulled, then somehow it can adjust better, and so the process is more, of unfolding is more effective. We also studied models in which you have lateral uh, things happening when you have a certain number of balls that breathe, and the radius changes, and this sort of rotates, so, and that also works in a similar fashion. So now neurodegeneracy. So I'll focus on uh, Huntington disease. And so this is one of the largest proteins known. It has 3,000 residues. And one part of it is called exon 1. And it consists of a track, uh, track, uh, tract, <laughs> I forgot. I mean, a chain of uh, Qs, a number of uh, polyglutamines, OK? And which are ended by some structures, a helix and some something structure, OK? But short pieces. And this is the part of the big thing, and, but this segment can easily be lysed away and it's present uh, as a part of Huntington, 
Huntington this protein or separately. And um, and also, and uh, so this is the number. So there are other proteins which also have this uh, this chains of polycules of cues. So at atrophin one, at some ataxin, and so on. So at, there are at least nine diseases which are in which this uh, presence of a chain of Q plays a role. So in the context of Huntington, it turns out that if it, in humans you, uh, the length of the of the of the track, track right, is uh, uh, like 20, between 21 and 26, but if it is more than 35, then it's toxic. Uh, so we started, before doing this, we started PolyQ independently because this was also the subject of experimental studies at Cajal Institute in Madrid. And, um, and they found that these uh, PolyQ chains can form, they have big mechanical polymorphisms that the, 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 if you stretch them, then you obtain all kinds of forces, you know, large and force between 50 and 400. And, um, uh, okay, so this is like this, uh, you know, ladybugs, they change conformation, so they also polycule go from one to another. And so they have all kinds of properties. So we started, uh, okay, there's one more thing that I should mention. And uh, that uh, usually neurodegeneracy is related to aggregation of forming, formation of fibers and such, and this is also true for Huntington disease, but it, there is an experimental proof in Japan that this is toxic also at monomeric level. Okay, so there's some mechanism of toxicity that is at the monomeric level. So there was a um, study by Cosio, uh, many authors, including Marit and Laya in 2010, in which they studied um, uh, chains of polyvalence, I mean, actually, of length 60, and they studied what kind of conformations you may get uh, with, for the system. And their consideration was really evolution. That was, they wanted, wanted to check what kind of, um, whether these conformations that you obtain for polyvalence of length 60 can uh, exist in CAF, you know, it's some protein data bank like CAF, characteristic structures or not. And it turns out that only a load of 35% of them actually have a partner in CAF, but most of them are not. So they said, okay, so evolution probably selected certain structures, and this was the story of theirs, okay? But now we use their method that was, the, and we repeated that for PolyQ of various lengths between 20 and 80, okay? So, so we follow the procedure exactly. It's a biased exchange molecular dynamics. So it's a metadynamics. And basically the idea is to find uh, in statistically independent structures that can arise in the system. Okay? So in, for polyvalent, which is simpler in many ways, uh, now they found like 3,000 or so uh, structures with our resources combining Spanish and Polish. We could get only 250. Uh, independent structure for the same length of 60. Uh, and uh, it turns out, interestingly, that 9.3% of them were noted. Okay? Whereas in polyvalent, there were m m maybe 3.6 and all shallow. Well, they, uh, Costio and others didn't look for you know, uh, nodes, but we look at the data. And whereas here you have certainly a bigger probability of knots, and furthermore, you also have deep knots. You know, for polyvalent, all you have is shallow knots, and these are, you can five two knots, you can have three one knots, and, and of course these are transient knots because they change transformation, but they can last for like 200 nanoseconds or more. All right, but they, they do uh, get the shape. Okay, so some examples of the structures that we found. And you can, and then, okay, and then we want to characterize it. So we then, they, this, this were derived by all atom simulations, but then we studied them by coarse grain model, like stretching and thermal stability and such. And, um, all right, so, and now, so this is the crucial point. So this, what this shows is that um, uh, this is the time of trans to do translocation, okay? That is to go through the thing, through, through the funnel. This is the probability of jamming. That is, if uh, the process takes longer than some power, I guess this is seven, number of unit, toys of order nanosecond. 
Okay? So if it's 10 to the 7, then we count it as jumps that it didn't go through. So if you study knotted fellows, you see that the probability of jamming is much higher than when you study other you know, no, unknotted forms, unknotted species. Okay? Even though the knot is transient, you can still jump. Okay, some of them do go through, and that is shown here. You know, uh, some of them are pretty fast, but uh, uh, you know, basically this is uh, now this is for the chain of 60 polyglutamines. But if you if you attach this to this short structure to end, you know, if you attach the terminal termini to the structured pieces, then the same story happens. We call it HCT. This, HT60 to describe that, but it's sort of qualitatively similar to whether you consider only cues or with additions, you get the same story. Uh, so, in other words, what we are trying to say here is that this is the role of the knot. You know, and oh, one more thing, you know, so you need a certain length of the chain to form a knot to start with. And this is how we found that it's a 4 to 35. So, below 35, you do not form a knot and there's no jamming. Okay. Whereas above, you do have nodes, and uh, then the, the jamming, therefore, they are degraded much less effect, uh, you know, this, you know, they get stuck, and then there may be a aggregation of this, and then may lead to, you know, other bad effects. And uh, uh, so, so far, well, I'm not done yet, uh, I try to argue that the robo ribosomes help proteins to form a node. But, uh, but proteasomes actually are, you know, uh, you know, are not really suited to degrade proteins with nodes, whether they are you know, stable nodes or transient nodes. Okay? So, and, maybe, and the existence of the threshold of 35 maybe is explained by the presence of the nodes. Of course, we just proposed it. It remains to be studied further, but at least we're pretty excited about it. Now, uh, let me f mention one thing, that is what happens when you have air-water interface. This is a very difficult problem to study by all atom simulations, because just if you want to study water you know, with an interface, water here, vapor there, then you need a huge number of molecules to maintain the density profile. Okay? So that's difficult in itself when you study surface tensions and people had to use all kinds of tricks to do that. And now I have an extra complication that I want to study proteins at that interface. Okay, so I am not that ambitious to study bio atoms, but if I use the coarse grain model, uh, then I can f introduce an effective force that mimics the thing. Okay, and and we were motivated by the experiment done by uh, Johns Hopkins, by Dan Reich, and Bob Lehany, and their graduate student Dan Allen, who is now at Brookhaven. And they studied these uh, layers of proteins like. Uh, lysozyme, you know, and then they put in a magnetic nano rod and they switch magnetic field and they studied glass or viscoelastic effect in these layers. And so, so what we do is that we find a phenomenological way of introducing this air-water interface and it goes through the hydropathy index. And we t there are 83 tables or more of these hydropathy indices, but the one which gets most Google citation is this one, Kite and Doolittle, of 1982. And uh, so, so hydrophilic amino acids come with the index of between minus four, you know, a negative, and hydrophobic a positive. So the whole thing ranges between minus 4.5 and plus 4.5. So we take this, we treat it as though it is a charge, like an electrostatic charge, and we couple it a Gaussian field, which is uh, it's centered at where the interface is supposed to be. It has a certain width, and we chose the width and the strength, um, so that when the protein comes to the interface, it stays there instead of going back, okay? That to make it easier. And uh, so what we do is that you then, so you see, you, see you have a native structure, say protein G, native structure of lysozyme, but when it comes to the interface, then the hydrophobic residues would like to be on the other side of the center of the interface, and hydrophilic would prefer, which are in green, would prefer to point towards water, okay? So then we started, you know, like 100 layer of 100 proteins and studied their behavior, 
and, uh, and we could show that this is a glassy behavior depending on the density, but I don't want to go into that. All I want to now, I want to mention that, let's say I have a, what happens to knotted proteins when you bring them to the air water interface, okay? If this is a deeply knotted protein, like this one J85, then it will get deformed, but the knot will stay put. However, if you take a, a shallow knotted protein, that it happens quite often that it unravels. I mean, that it un ceases being knotted. Okay, so we, that's what we observe, and there are some mechanisms that show that, when direct threading mechanism or something. So when it, it comes here, if you need the bulk, and then it starts to be deformed, eventually it becomes dead, and in the bypro as a byproduct, it may lose it not, its knot. But another thing is that uh, what we found also two proteins, usually membrane proteins, such that, which are knotted, at yet, not, yet on coming to the interface, they become knotted because, say, one terminus is hydrophobic. So with some chance, you know, you would, would like to drive to the interface and peer through the protein and go there and make a knot. So this is a, a theoretical prediction. No one has studied it. This is not published. We're struggling <laughs> to consider. I mean, uh, but I hope it will be published eventually. So this is this, some pic pictures of some of the people involved. So this is Huang, Jana Sukowska, Piotr Szymczak, Wojciechowski, who studied, um, who actually I didn't emphasize it well enough, but he was involved in all this uh, modeling of uh, proteosome in terms of the funnel. And Mateusz Chwastik also worked on these proteins. And, he, and this is the fellow who is about to graduate and he'll be a postdoc in Arizona. Uh, in January, Mateusz Sikora, Mark Robbins, Angel Gomez Cecilia, who was involved in this uh, poly-Q thing, and that's half of his thesis, and Mariano Carion Vasquez, who is an experimentalist, a biologist, and we took drinking lots of wine, that's our best way of doing research, came up with this model of the proteasome. So it's not a purely theoretical invention, it was actually done in collaborations and experiments. Thank you very much. Thank you.